Tekalit Health and Wellness Society bring to you Telling Their Stories, a podcast that brings to you testimonies from families and friends of Canadian high school and university-aged football players who have had a member pass away by suicide or who are dealing with mental health challenges themselves. My name is Katie Utley, founder of Tackleit. I will be interviewing families and others who may be experiencing or have experienced these tragic and difficult life circumstances and mental health challenges. I will also be chatting with other health and wellness professionals and coaches about these issues. Telling their stories may include issues such as substance abuse, suicide, sexual assault, and more. If you are struggling with any of the above topics, this may not be the right series for you or you may want to watch it with a trusted adult. If you are in crisis at any time, please call Kids Help Phone at 833-456-4566 or visit crisisservicescanada.ca. And now, let's honour those who are telling their stories. So, welcome to Telling Their Stories. We have uh, another special guest, Farhan Lalji. He's the, um, some of you may recognize that name and face, the TSN reporter out here in Vancouver. Um, But that's not all he is. The way I know you is through uh, coaching. You coach with my husband, Clint. Um, you're actually the reason that we're out here, which is, you know, just amazing, <laughs> um, with the new Westminster high Axe. And this year, well, this pandemic year, you took off without even knowing that that was going to happen, which is kind of interesting. And then now you, you know, you, you maybe you're probably taking this next year off and then, and then who knows what happens after that. So, um, but Farhan, yeah, he's been quite successful in the sport media world. He's won numerous awards and been to covering all events at all different levels, which is awesome. And uh, he did go to SFU, Simon Fraser, uh, where he did try out for football and unfortunately an injury ended that career. So um, Farhan, I'm just going to let you take it over and fill in some holes there, you know, just your kind of, I guess, brief football journey, but, you know, even coming up through the sport media world and working with athletes and football, hockey, all that type of stuff. And then we'll get into some other mental health questions. Well, um, you know, as far as football goes, it started for me in uh, the 10th grade didn't play much before that but uh, i got started then and the um i went from junior high to, to senior high at burnaby central here and in, uh, in the lower mainland and i wound up playing there for a couple of years and i, I really really um enjoyed my head coach at the time alex reed who has probably been my biggest mentor in coaching and um what happened was more than anything, I, you know, I, people ask me why you got into coaching. And I think really I got into coaching because I wanted to stay around him. Mm. Uh, so when I, when I graduated high school, uh, I played junior football for a few years uh, with the Vancouver Marilomas who, who don't exist anymore, but they did 10 and uh, played there for a few years. And, and then in my second year, I also went back and began coaching. So I would, you know, go coach at the high school uh, for two hours and then leave from there and go to my own junior football practices. <laughs> Uh, I was going to uh, w- walk on, right? Like I attempted to walk onto the program at SFU and did their spring, their off season training and their spring ball, which would have been around uh, 88 or 89, kind of somewhere in that window. And then I, I had a bit of an injury and that kind of set me back a little bit. And then I went back and played junior and, and, you know, in order to stay, you know, eligible and to continue to go down the, the university path, I would have had to do some different things course wise, uh, which I wasn't really prepared to do. So at that point, you know, I finished up my junior career and just focused on coaching which became a real big passion of mine for a long time. So I coached at Burnaby Central for a very long time uh, until uh, 2000, in fact. Okay. And then the coach that, uh, that you know, Alex wound up retiring, um, I think after the 98 year, and then I continued to coach there for a couple of years. It wasn't really working out for me without him there. So then I left and then I coached at Vancouver College for two years. And Todd Burnett, who's the coach now, was coaching then. Um, he was a, a coordinator my first year there and then became the head coach my second year there. And I really enjoyed coaching with him and working in that program because, you know, it really is a place that that has a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. And so through all of that, um, you know, I used to coach spring ball at UBC and at Simon Fraser and I would coach division one camps and cross the line and get into my car and coach at the University of Washington and coach at other places. And, you know, that that's on a lot of levels. I thought that was going to be my journey. Right. Um, And then in uh, 94. Uh, early on, right, like while I was still at Burnaby Central, I got uh, my first media job, and I got a job doing radio, uh, producing a radio show, 
uh, and that year the Canucks were going to the Stanley Cup final. And, and I had never, um, you know, I'd never taken a broadcasting course because at Simon Fraser, I majored in communications, but that's got nothing to do with broadcasting. I mean, it may now, but it certainly didn't then. So, I, you know, I've never taken a broadcast course per se. And then in 94, I got my first media job. And, you know, it was right around then that I, I was kind of making decisions, that, you know, and I had some coaching opportunities. And, you know, I remember coaching at, um, you know, at Washington's camp and ran across an assistant coach who, who was the receiver coach at the time. And, you know, he said to me, he goes, you know, I, I really like what you're doing here. And if you want to really pursue this, I can help you. And, you know, and I was at a bit of a crossroads and I always tell the story, Jeff Reinbold, who's the special teams coach with the Hamilton Ticats, Jeff's a good friend of mine. We go back a long way. You know, my first job in 94, he was with the Lions at the time as a special teams coordinator. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, he was bouncing back and forth between like from Vegas to BC when they had the U.S. expansion. So Joe Papow and, and Jeff Reinbold were the coaches with the Lions. And I went out to the Lions facility and, and we were going to go have some dinner and some drinks after. And I was in his office. And he said to me, you know, just hang on. I got to go do something. I'll be right back. And while he was gone for five minutes, I noticed his resume was on his desk. So I looked at his resume. He he had been to, wow, he'd probably been to like 10 schools in eight years or eight schools in 10 years. And every little tiny podunk town in America, it seemed he had been to, you know, those limited earnings positions, (laughs) you know, you pay, you get paid 12 grand for the year and you live in your car, right? And there's such a romantic notion of that for people who get into college coaching in the United States, you know, and I thought to myself, I don't want this life for a family I don't even have yet. Right. (laughs) So, uh, you know, this media thing is going okay. So let me stick with this for a while and see where it goes, you know, and then uh, that radio show that I was doing only lasted a year. um, And the station made a format change. And, and then, um, you know, for, for about nine months, I wasn't, working. I mean, you know, in my industry, we call that freelance, right? When you're actually not working, you don't have a job. <laughs> so I, I was debating at that time, which way, which way I wanted to go. Do I want to dive That's back into coaching? And then, and then um, in 95, in the fall, uh, after about nine months of just kind of figuring it out and trying to build my resume and learn other things in the industry, uh, I got a job. My good friend, Barry McDonald, who, who's now retired, Barry uh, was a legendary sportscaster in this town. And he was he used to be at sports page, which was a legendary show. And he went from sports page to CBC and then he was going back to sports page. So CBC needed somebody to hire. So they offered me a job, um, anchoring the weekend news. And I had never, ever read a teleprompter before. So, oh, you dear. Know, I thought, I thought, can't I just do a little bit of sports reporting for a little bit and just kind of cut my teeth, you know, in, in an area that I knew. And they said, no, 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 you're anchoring the weekend news, not just the sports, you're doing the whole 30 minute show. So you've got to, you know, they wanted somebody who understood how to produce the news as well as, you know, read it on camera. But, you know, they had a newsroom that would produce the news and weather part. And then, you know, they just wanted to have one person come in and read it all. And I'm sure that my ethnicity had something to do with the hire, right? I mean, you, mm-hmm. you know, I'm naive enough to admit that because if somebody completely unqualified gets a job there's probably an additional reason right so i remember i'd already been hired and i i remember doing a screen test after i had been hired reading a teleprompter oh wow and i was the worst i was the worst (laughs) you know and just like when i did my first radio show i was producing and and then at some point i had to host because the canucks were in the stanley cup finals and all of our fill-in hosts were traveling with the canucks and one day just i had to host you know and so i was i was awful then and then you kind of got better but it was those moments where I knew I really enjoyed it and I was able to do that and continue coaching. So I really felt like I had the best of both worlds because, you know, you go into coaching and who knows what that's going to look like and what Mm -hmm. steps you're going to have to take up the ladder. Uh, If I had ever gone down that road, you know, I never had any aspirations of coaching Canadian college football or coaching in the CFL. My dream would have been to be a division one head coach. Like that would have been the dream job. Right. Um, but when you looked at the steps people had to take, unless you were a high profile division one player or an NFL player, you're not going to be able to skip a few steps. You know, you've got to go in the division three route and, you know, be a volunteer coach and then get to know somebody who's successful and ride his coattails for a bit and work your way up. And, you know, there's no shortcuts when you, when you don't have uh, a big resume as a player. So I, I just felt at the time that, um, this was the best thing for me. I got to work with kids, which really mattered a lot. 
uh, I coached it, as I mentioned, I coached at Vancouver College in 90 or 2001, 2002. And quite frankly, as, as wonderful as the program and the people were, I wasn't feeling it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not a shot on them because Todd Burnett's a great guy. He's a good friend. It's a great program, but I just felt I wasn't making an impact, you know, and, um, it mattered to me to make an impact. It mattered to me to make a difference in the lives of people. And I, d- I realized in my second year that I, I needed to, um, you know, poop or get off the pot, one of the two, right? And I either needed to start my own program and become a head coach, and, or I needed to get out of coaching altogether. Mm. Um, and it really came to that kind of a crossroads because when, when Alex retired after the 98 season, he wanted me to be the head coach. And I thought, you know, I'm not really ready yet. And, you know, the, you know, some of the people in the school aren't going to support me the way the program needs supporting. So let's get somebody else and I can work with them and it seemed like the right thing. And it, it didn't work out after two years. And then I went to VC for two years and it, w- it was good. And, you know, I had other opportunities at other schools. I had opportunities at both universities uh, locally. And it's just not what I wanted. I realized that I wanted to be a head coach. So I, I went to um, a few different schools. I got approached by some people to start programs. Okay. Uh, New West is a place that we had targeted, right? I grew up in South Burnaby, not that far away, and I knew they had a very close knit community. Um, you know, New West is a is a small town disguised as a suburb, right? Um, you know, the mentality of New West is very small town, and I think I always felt that could lend a really successful program. And then we had the stadium; they were turning this underutilized grass stadium to turf lights the year we wanted to start a football program. So. Uh-huh. All the stars lined up, and I remember Andrew McKechnie, our offensive coordinator, and I, we walked in and, and we uh, uh, met with the athletic director and the vice principal, and the vice principal was actually a former BC Lion okay. and had played at Simon Fraser, and he was a football guy, and you know, I gave him a business plan, and they poked holes in all of it, and left that meeting thinking, they don't want us here, uh, and then afterwards the athletic director called me and he says listen i've checked out your references and you know people speak highly of you and and i want you to come have a meeting with the students and we'll we'll promote it and see what interest there is so i said okay so we went we had a meeting and 115 people showed up oh wow and the the principal was there at the meeting and what they realized is of, of those 115 people only maybe eight or ten were attached to any other school program so all of a sudden, the admin at the time thought, okay, well, now we have a, a way to attach all of these other people to the school. So let's, let's, find, let's see what happens. Let's try and say yes. And so they said yes, and we went from there, right? And we, start, we started in, uh, in the weight room. You know, like I, during the 2002 season, BC, both years I was there, was in the provincial championship game, and I was kind of going through this in November while prepping for the provincial championship game. And um, kind of operating on parallel paths and, you know, going through some personal stuff at the time as well. And then we kind of finally made the decision or, you know, to, to, to do all of this. And, um, yeah, I I just went right from that championship game to opening the weight room the next Monday at new West. Like it really was that. Wow. So there was no break and we just, we opened up the weight room and we had all these kids and, um, it was, it was totally just the coolest thing to take something from an idea Mm-hmm. and turn it into reality because in New Westminster not only was there no history of football like it's not just that people weren't playing high school football because they went 25 years without a high school football program mm-hmm. there was no youth football mm-hmm. people didn't even wear football jerseys like if you walk down the streets in the elementary schools there was nobody throwing a football around um back then remember the the football jersey fubu f-u-b-u mm-hmm like that was like a trendy thing for a while. People didn't even wear FUBU jerseys at, at, in New Westminster. Like there was no <laughs> culture on any level, no CFL, no NFL, no nothing. Wow. And so to go into a community where people couldn't spell football if you gave them the foot and, and turn it into a place that Friday night games, as you know, firsthand, it's become a real thing yeah. in, in that community. Right? So um, it was pretty cool to just kind of go there and, pick out the uniforms, buy the equipment, um, you know, what do you want it to look like? What do you want your philosophy to be? And just to kind of go through that whole process and really get the town to buy in, uh, go to business people and say, look, I have an idea. I have, I haven't done it before, but I, you know, I, I can, I'm, I'm talking a good game at this point. I'm just selling them on an idea. And in many cases, selling them on me. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, everybody bought in. I, I remember I had a $50,000 budget. I said to this, to the principal, 
Um, you don't know me. Here's my business plan. I need fifty thousand uh, dollars. I need and I need three years to raise it. Here's my plan. And she said, okay, you know. And we raised it all in wow. one year. So then the second year, I said, I need twenty thousand dollars to uh, or fifteen thousand dollars or whatever it was to buy a scoreboard. She said, okay. And she just didn't ask a second question. It was literally a sixty second meeting, and she signed the requisition. Oh, okay. um, because because we showed her the first year that we could do this right. Uh, so, you know, and we built the press box and we, you know, we did all of these things and it was just, heck, I remember building the press box for the scoreboard in my, my father-in-law built it on his farm. And then we had a truck take that press box to the high school. Um, you know, we had the engineer from the city come out to his farm to look at this, to make sure it structurally met code, brought it in and we, we had it raised up and took the old thing down and replaced it. Like all these little things that I just remember, like it was yesterday. Um, you know, and then you, you win games. Like the very first game we played in 2003, uh, we played West Van High School. The very first drive, we took it down the field, 12 plays and scored a touchdown on the very first drive of our very first game. Oh, that's awesome. And the place just went like the, the sideline just went ballistic and we lost the game 10, seven, but it didn't, it didn't matter. Right. I mean, um, it was just kind of that, that moment. Like I remember, I remember the kid scoring. I remember the exact play he scored on and, um, you know, it, it was just a, that kind of moment. And then you, you know, you fast forward and you, you have all the, you know, we had, a uh, our first playoff win against, uh, this school Bellinas the following season, um, where we, you know, we kind of just, went back and forth and there were like four lead changes literally in the last um, three minutes of the game. And, and, I, and I remember one of the players, like a couple of players in the game couldn't hear the audibles because the stadium was so loud that day. Right. <laughs> and, and we had like this, we had fog that had come down over the stadium. So it was a, a scene out of the movies. I've even got mm -hmm. a picture of it. And, you know, kids to this day will tell me it was the best moment they've ever had in sport. Oh, and so Justin cool. Morneau, who's a new West resident. You remember the baseball player who won the MVP at one point. He was um, uh, he was an MVP and he was having a great season and, and he you know it was now his off season and he had come back he had gone to New Westminster and so we invite you know I invited Justin to the game came and watched the game and I tipped off a bunch of media that there was going to be just Justin was going to be at the game so a bunch of television cameras came to this game <laughs> midst of all they were just like wow this game is crazy and they showed highlights on the shows and the game Justin came up to me and said you are an a hole. And I said, what? What do we do? It was a great game. And he said, because you didn't have this when I was here. And, uh, um, you know, and I remember the, the, the coaches, like the players on both teams were crying. It was such an emotional game. And, and um, my wife showed up, you know, and my wife, who you know, loves every part of our football program except the football part. I know. Right? <laughs> Oh, like she, she loves the kids and the community and the building, but the football, eh, take it or leave it. Right. So she came at the end of the game and all these people were crying and she assumed we lost. And I had to explain to her what had happened. Um, you know, so, you know, those moments. And then when, you know, you were there when we won the provincial championship in 2017 and, you know, we, we had those first two years. And then in 2005, we moved up to triple a the third year. Mm -hmm. And, um, we had a really good season and there was, it was a strike shortened year. The school year got, we lost about three to four weeks of our football season because of a strike. And um, I had to find ways to keep the kids together. And we wound up uh, getting upset in the playoffs because that year were actually really good. And um, so I thought this was going to be easy, just a simple ascension. You know, we made the playoffs the first year, had all these cool experiences, won that first playoff game, moved up to the next level, having all the success and then we kind of crashed and burned in 06 and we had a couple of tough years and then we, you know, rebuilt a little bit and, and then got to a point where we were regularly in the final four and, but we still had to get over that hump. Mm -hmm. And then we, we won the provincial title in, in 2017 in the most improbable way. Um, so, you know, just all of those steps to kind of get it to that point. I remember going back into the locker room after the, the 17 championship and um, I probably had 300 text messages or social posts of alumni and community members hmm. like congratulating me and they were all still engaged and they all watched the game online and it was 
you know, like just to kind of see something like that kind of resonate and you can kind of build it through a generation and see players, kids and all of those things. So it's been really rewarding. And, um, and then last year, uh, I decided, you know, I, I decided after the 28, 2019 season, um, you know, we got to the finals in back to back years. And then we, you know, the following year, uh, I felt was kind of the first time in a long time we had underachieved, uh, as a team. And, um, I was feeling burned out, you know, and you and I talked about it before I'd made the decision. And I just decided, you know, I wasn't prepared to fully walk away because really this program was my first child, mm -hmm. you know, um, I've got two wonderful children, but this program was my first child and it was difficult for me to walk away. So I just said, look, I'm burned out. I totally am feeling it. And it's not really the coaching. It's the 12 month cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to run a program at the highest level. And, you know, for me, I, w I didn't want to compare myself to Canadian programs. I wanted to run a U.S. program in Canada. That was the goal. And whether or not we won multiple championships, it was not that. It was the experience that we provided the kids. And when you want to offer that much, it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. and you want full engagement. And the cycle was burning me out. Um, and I needed to step off the cycle. So uh, I told the coaches in December when we came back that that was it. And when we came back... Um, Start of January from the, uh, the, we had our first team meeting the second day back after Christmas break. And I told the players and at the time it was ironic because there was no pandemic. And, uh, you know, I was really hoping that I would miss the season. Like I would, I was hoping I'd miss coaching. I was hoping I would come to the Friday night games with the big crowds and watch Clint do his thing on the sidelines uh, and miss it and, and want to come back the next year. And ironically, they didn't get, they didn't coach. Mm -hmm. Like they coached. You know, they had the high school kids out for two months and they practiced and, and God bless them. They kept the kids engaged, but I coached more than they did because my son seventh grade and I coached his youth team. Um, and it was one of the best recharging experiences of my life because I'd helped his teams previously, but I wasn't really invested. Mm -hmm. I just kind of came when I could because the high school thing was, it just, it was too difficult. I didn't have anything left after a high school practice to go coach his youth team. So now I invested in him and I invested in, in his friends. And, um, you know, I spent 20 minutes a week practice planning and 20 minutes a week on film. It was awesome. <laughs> right. Like imagine, imagine what we were doing at new West on a weekly basis. So I just got to do that with his youth team. It was so much fun. Um, that I, I just said, look, I need this. Number one, I didn't miss high school cause there was no high school. And number two, he's going into grade eight and I'm going to coach his last year of youth football, uh, with him. Uh, cause I, I just got so much out of it that, mm -hmm. um, I, it was more important to me to do that. I figure for, I've been coaching 31 years of high school football wow. as an assistant and head coach and I just, and 17 at new West. And I just felt, um, I've given 31 years to other people's kids. I need to give these two years to mine. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, there's a coach uh, named Kevin chin. Um, so some of you, uh, might recall his son, Casey chin. Mm -hmm. So Casey, um, was a record setting linebacker at Simon Fraser, got drafted by the lions had a three year CFL career. Uh, now he trains CFL players. So I knew Kevin for a long time and Kevin coached um, high school football for years and years, decades. And then all of a sudden the, the years that I was at Vancouver college, Kevin decided to step back from coaching. Um, and he, um, he, sorry, the two years I was at Vancouver college or somewhere in there in that mix, he decided he was going to step back. And um, I'm like, why would you step back? And it was because he wanted to coach Casey in his two years of junior mm -hmm. man of football. And at the time, as much as I liked Kevin, I, I couldn't wrap my head around the decision because I was just so into the high school part of it and how important it was that I, I like, why can't you just help your son out here and there and just coach the high schools? It's so much, mm -hmm. you know, you're making a difference to so many more kids. I, and I never said that to him, but I didn't get it. I mm -hmm. truly didn't get it. And then Kevin, um, when, when I was starting the program up at New West in 2006, Kevin then decided he wanted to send his sons to New West. Because it was the only school in the area that had a football program and French immersion. Okay. His wife was Francophone, Sylvie. Um, and so uh, so he brought them over. And, and you know, we weren't we were colleagues. We, we weren't buddies, right? I mean, he had a lot of friends in coaching. So it's not like he came because of me. He really thought both of these things were important. So he so brought them. And then I got to know him a lot better. And we talked a lot more. And in Casey's second year... Kevin's second year with us, um, they were on vacation in Florida and he got a staff infection and during our fall camp and he passed away. 
And our program was devastating. Mm -hmm. He'd only been in our program for two years. And you can only imagine how, how his kids felt. And I yeah. thought to myself, wow, thank God he took those two years. Like, thank mm -hmm. God he took those two years, right? So, um, you know, I did a lot of soul searching. And, you, you know, you and I spoke. And I spoke to a lot of people. And I just decided this was the right thing. And you don't get these times back. So I'm really glad I'm doing it. And then whether or not I come back, you know, like I'd like to come back. But it really depends on what my son wants to do. Because... Um, he's also a hockey player and that could mm -hmm. take priority and, you know, so we'll see, but, you know, I'm not saying I'm done coaching high school yet. You never know what's going to happen. All I know is I sound like an athlete now when I say one year at a time. So, uh, this year I'm going to coach his uh, youth team. And, um, then after that, if he plays high school football at new West, then I'll coach at new West in whatever capacity the other coaches want me to coach in. And, um, if he doesn't, then we'll just, we'll just have to see. But, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of my story of how I got into television, how I got into coaching, and um, yeah, that, that's me. Wow, like I know, uh, I had, I mean, I know bits and pieces of that story, but um, it's just incredible when I talk to coaches, you know, such as yourself or other ones who have been in coaching for so long. And it's just, I always just say thank you so much because you, you just, like you said, you give so much of yourself, like often your family is neglected. I mean, I know that firsthand <laughs> being married to a, a long-term coach. Um, the only thing is, is that I actually like football, <laughs> so it's a little bit different there, but um, my question to you is, so in that 31 years, you know, you've seen kids come through different uh, generations, I guess you could say. What do you think in terms of their, because you and I have spoken briefly about mental health and, and athletes and that type of thing, and you have a, a unique perspective. Um, what do you think, or how have, how has the athlete in the high school era evolved to now in terms of um, the way coaches are coaching, the way programs are running their programs, what is, um, what, you know, could be called acceptable or not acceptable stigmas, all of that. How do you think that whole generation from when you started to now has evolved or changed? Well, I mean, I, look, I think it's reflective in all of society, right? Because even relationships have changed, right? Um, we are much more in touch with our feelings. We much, we, we much more try to uh, tangibly relationship build. So, uh, for example, um, like I, I say, I get really annoyed at coaches who say kids have changed, mm. right? Because I think that's such a crutch for a coach to say, I shouldn't try as hard because it requires so much more because these kids don't get it. And they, mm. they kind of put the onus on the kids. And I'm not sure that that's the case, right? Like I think society has changed. I think circumstances around kids have changed, you know, the social media generation mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and I think we parent differently. And I think part of it is that quest to really find out how people feel. And I, I mm -hmm. think there's positive and negative to that. You know, you and I talked before and I, and I said, look, Katie, I, I love you and I'm happy to do a podcast and help you any way I can, but I'm not necessarily a mental health guy. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's not to diminish what mental health is because yeah totally respect and believe that people have mental health issues. But I, I do believe that you have to operate on parallel tracks as it relates to mental health, because I think that not everybody who claims to have mental health does mm -hmm. mental health issues. And I also believe that many people who will not acknowledge mental health issues have them, mm -hmm. right? I think we go in two different directions on it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important for us to truly try to know people and find out what makes somebody tick and at the same and you know and acknowledge what they might be feeling but at the same time you also want to build resiliency mm -hmm. and and I think it's okay for coaches to still say we want to teach mental toughness mm -hmm. because I think people will say well if you say that now you're one of those old school uh, coaches that doesn't truly get it yeah well no not really because I, I think Part of my job is to be as empathetic as possible, right? And uh, not sympathetic, but empathetic. And, and that's almost more important. So I've had many kids that have had mental health issues and I've tried to help provide them with resources or sounding boards or just an environment that um, allows them to feel comfortable. You know, probably one of the best compliments I've ever had as a coach 
Um, early in my time at New West, we had a player that eventually, after he left New West, came out of the closet. Mm-hmm. Now he was homosexual, and which is not to compare homosexuality to mental health issues, but um, there are stigmas around both, yeah. right? Uh, and there are people who have both of that, you know, that are uh, LGBTQ and, and also that have mental health issues that have not been able to come forward with them, that are afraid to come forward. Right. You know, whether you're coming out of the closet or whether you're admitting you've got a mental health issue. So the only parallels I draw are there, mm-hmm. right? Because there's challenges. Um, you know, so this one player, uh, a couple years later, his best friend um, was helping us coach and he spoke at our banquet. And he, he said, and I, and I didn't know, he, he talked about this one player feeling like he, he never felt like he couldn't say that he, he never felt like he was in, envi- in an environment in our program where he couldn't come clean and say that he was homosexual, wow. right? Like he never felt like that he was in such a masculine, mm-hmm. um, closed minded environment with players and coaches that he was afraid. Now, ultimately, he had his own, uh, you know, um, enlightenment moment where he realized, right? Like he probably saw steps along the way and it took him a while after high school before he finally realized that, yeah, this is who I am, Mm -hmm. right? But in that process, he always felt safe and comfortable in our program that, you know, while he was thinking that maybe he had, that maybe he was gay, uh, he never felt like he couldn't say that. Now, he Mm -hmm. didn't ultimately say it in our program because he still had, you know, it, it's not like you could just keep it isolated. You, you know, you, you generally, when somebody uh, comes out with this, it's, it's a lifelong thing, right? It's, it's everybody, but or everybody that winds up knowing that, you, yeah. you know, you wind up talking about it with. So that was a real compliment to me that we had created an environment mm. where that person felt like they could say what they needed to say and be who they believed they were. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to believe that that carries over for somebody who might have some mental health issues, right? And it certainly has for us. Um, you know, and I think I remember early in my career, I was very black and white with my rules. And, um, you know, I demanded you, you know, come to practice on time this way, this way. And there was an academic standard and so on and so forth. And if you couldn't meet my, my policies, then you had three strikes and you were cut. Mm -hmm. And then we had this one player who just couldn't commit. He wanted to be involved and they kept wanting to come back, but ultimately they just couldn't live up to the standard I'd set. So I said, well, what's the compromise? And like my wife said to me at the time, you know, this person might be giving you all that they can give and they might be giving you more than they've ever given anybody before. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. So I, I never thought of it that way. No. And I said, okay, so what's the compromise? So the compromise for me was I'm not going to cut that player. Um, I will still have all my standards mm-hmm. before I let that player play in a game, right? Because I have to be able to you know, everybody else has to live with the same standard. You know what I mean? Like if yeah. you completely let it go, then the player who maybe isn't giving you everything they can, uh, then they take advantage of it if you're, if you're lax. Right. So I decided, look, I'm not going to cut you. I'm going to continue to work with you, but I'm not going to play you in a game until you can get to all the practices in the week until you can do some of these other things, but I want to be here for you. Mm-hmm. And if I can help you in any other way, overcome some of these things, then we do that. Right. And, um, you know, it, it's taught me a lot about the fact that, you know, not everybody's the same. Um, you know, as coaches, we want to reach everybody. But we don't only want to reach everybody. We want to reach them all now. Mm-hmm. And we want to reach them while they're still with us. So, like, you know, I've got kids that came in before grade, you know, between grade 8 and 9. Mm-hmm. They were at risk. They were wayward. And by the time they got to grade 12, they became these great students and great leaders. But there were, so that's great. So we got to see them, we got to help them and we got to benefit, Mm -hmm. right? Because it it happened in our cycle with them, but that's also selfish, right? Because sometimes you're not going to get there with people. You're going to wind up helping them get through this time in their lives. You're going to help give them some building blocks, but they might not get it. They might not figure it out until they're in their twenties, right? Until they're a father, until when, you know, so when you, when you realize that, you know, you hope that you're just there for people, you know, they might not admit to you that they've got a mental health issue. They might not want to go there, but they just still want to be around. They still want to be in your environment. They still feel safe. Um, They just want to be able to escape what they're dealing with in other areas of their life. 
So you just you just want to be there. And then if they wind up feeling that they can come to you and admit to you, and in some cases, they haven't admitted it to themselves yet, mm. right? Um, and they've got to go through a process of getting to that point, right? So they may come to you, they may admit it, they may not, they may, um, they, they may figure it out five years after they leave, right? Uh, or 10 years after the leave or whenever it is, you just hope you can give them enough that one day uh, they just, they can figure it out for their it's own like, family mm-hmm. they can pay it forward. Right. Um, I like how you said that you're um, I think it's really cool that you mentioned, you know, when you first started your coaching career, you're very black and white and, you know, you've, you've evolved, obviously um, you're probably one of the more caring coaches that I've ever met. Um how did you create that environment in your program where, you know, that player said he felt very comfortable or safe? How did you create that culture within your program? Um, it's a good question. You know, it, it took some time and, and I think a lot of it is shared vision, right? Because you, you know, you, you work with a lot of other coaches and I think, I think part of leadership is to, um, you know, you want everyone to see your vision, but sometimes you've got to alter it because you want to make sure it's a shared vision. So you've got complete right. buy-in from it mm-hmm. uh, because you can't just do anything, your, everything yourself. Um, and then you kind of have to prioritize ultimately what's important to you. And you see coaches at the collegiate level, and some of them are strategists. Some of them, you know, they're these great innovative offensive minds and others are um, motivators and others are, you know, that Nick Saban CEO type of coach. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I just found that, the, the longer I was doing it, the more culture mattered to me and community mattered to me, right? Mm-hmm. And the football piece just became the language, right? right. So I, it was, it became easier for me as we went, because when I started, I wanted to be the strategist. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be the offensive whiz kid. Uh, and it, it took some time for me to just get over myself. And, and I think also, I, you know, when I realized that I definitely don't want to advance as a coach to the next level, right? Right. Um, then it really became about the kids. And, and I just think that you're going to get so much more out of a kid if you care about them. And, you know, I talked to you about my coaching mentors and, you know, Alex Reed was one of them. Um, you know, and the one thing he taught me was uh, just how you live your life, you know, because he was part of the old school in that he didn't tangibly try to build those relationships. He just lived his life mm. and he lived it in a really, really wonderful way where he was a good dad, a good coach, uh, a good husband, a good teacher. You know, he was a science teacher. You got all these other teachers or football coaches that want to go teach math and, you know, um, automotive or whatever they want to teach. He taught honors science, honors math and honors chemistry. Wow. Right. And, and had all that marking because he liked teaching those subjects. So he was fanatically prepared about that. He, you know, taught football like it was science. Um, you know, so he just kind of lived his life the right way. And that's kind of the lesson I took there. Then one of my other mentors was Allison McNeil. Now, Allison McNeil was uh, the head coach at Simon Fraser University, head women's basketball coach at SFU when I knew her, because I was the sports information director from uh, 91 to 94 at SFU after I finished school. So Allison and I, our offices were across the hall and we would talk all the time and we would go for lunch all the time. And then our journeys took us, you know, I went to TSN, she wound up coaching the national team and we were in London together at the 2012 Olympics. She was coaching team Canada okay. and I was covering the Olympics for TSN. It was, it was really cool, but um, I'm digressing along the way. What I noticed about Allison, because she had an unbelievable record of success at Simon Fraser and she knew the game inside and out and she would scream and yell at her players. Like you wouldn't believe hmm. like she had this ear piercing shrill games that this five foot two point guard coach would slam her heels into the court and yell at you know Nadine get over here like it was crazy wow and I'm thinking how could she do that um but what I would also then see is that same girl would be in her office crying and Allison would be crying because that girl had lost a parent that girl had broken up with a boyfriend that girl Mm. had received some tragic news and Allison was the second parent and because they knew just how much she cared. She could get everything out of them on the court and she Mm. could be as demanding as she wanted in front of 3000 people in that gym. And they weren't embarrassed. They just loved her. And so I just, I learned that from Allison, right? That um, just care, just care. You'll get as much as humanly possible. You'll squeeze every drop of juice out of the orange if you care. And um, 
So that matters to me. So I'll let the other coaches handle the X's and O's. And I'm good with that. You know, you can ask uh, Andrew, our offensive coordinator. I've stepped back. You know, I, I used to, like, when he first became OC, I would probably question half the play calls. And then over the course of, you know, my, by the time we had the last year together, I might question two to three a game, right? Mm-hmm. And it just changed. And I evolved as a coach. That stuff mattered less to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just trusted those people, you know. And my third mentor is Wally Bono. And one thing I learned from Wally is create a professional environment to allow your your people to succeed, mm-hmm. right? And I just wanted to do that where the coaches didn't have to worry about money or resources or players or th- program building. You just coach, right? If you want to do more, I'm going to encourage you because I want you to build relationships as well so you can get what out of it, what, what I got out of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said, one of the reasons I left VC is I felt that I couldn't really build those relationships right. because they had so many other people doing that. And, and again, God bless them. I'm not being critical. Uh, I just felt like I could. So mm-hmm. I just had to go somewhere and build something where I could. So um, I, di- I didn't want any other coach to ever feel that way. So I certainly wanted to encourage uh, those relationships and, and all those things. But if you don't have it, if, you, if that's not your thing, just coach, do everything you can. And I'll try to build enough stuff around you with volunteer bases and things like that. And that's kind of what Wally taught me was just create a professional environment for people around you to do their job. And then you focus on what's the most important thing to you. Hmm. That's awesome. So just lastly, um, before we sign off here, just looking into the future or, you know, maybe you have some insight into how you think things are going, even at the professional level, how, where, how better equipped are we now within the football community to, either handle or um, aid someone with mental health issues, or it doesn't even have to be mental health issues. It could be just anything, circumstances in life to um, building relationships with players. How do you think we can do that better? Well, I think we should really not be not afraid to lead. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I I mentioned earlier that I get all these coaches uh, or teachers at at the high school. I don't want to coach. Kids have changed all of that nonsense. The truth is, at their core, kids at this age still want to be led, mm. and they want to believe in the people that are leading them. Yeah. And they've got, like I said, they've got all this stuff, you know, social media and poor girl pressures, and some of them are dealing with mental health issues, and um, there's so many more variables that are around mm-hmm. that they want to be in tune with themselves on, and they, and they need guidance, and they need leadership, and I just think it's important that if you want to coach, do not be afraid to lead. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, so many people, they just want to be your buddy. But at some point, you know, that's not what a player's coach is. It's not friendship. Right. You have to be you have to be comfortable leading. Uh, You have to be empathetic so that they can talk and you have to understand that everybody's different. But, you know, when I when I hear people like um, go back and look at Shaquille O'Neal's story and his the influence that Dale Brown had on him, who was his Mm -hmm. collegiate coach right at LSU. And he, he only had a small period of time there. But you'll, you'll see just how much that person resonated uh, to him and, and his world with this seven foot two giant who became an icon in basketball, right? Um, that person wanted to be led. It's, you know, and he had, he had everything he could have wanted, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Michael Jordan stayed through his collegiate career. He wanted to be led. It was ultimately his coach that told him after his junior year, go to the NBA, mm-hmm. right? Um, but they have those desires to be led the best in the world. So I just don't think we should be afraid uh, if we want to prepare them for the next step, uh, you know, one of the things that happens with parents, parents lose a connection to their kids. And I always encourage parents to stay connected after your kid transitions from youth to high school, because what's the single biggest difference? You're driving your kid to youth practices. Once they get to high school, you don't do that anymore. Ah, oh, yeah, right? good point. The kid goes from school to practice. Mm-hmm. So now that connection becomes lost. Mm-hmm. And all these other you know, things that are happening in the kid's life. He's being exposed to drugs. He's now hitting puberty. He's thinking about girls. Like there's all of these things that are so critical and, you know, you might lose that parental connection. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. the coach, and and in some cases, the assistant coaches or whoever, like everybody around, um, you want to create that environment where you can be empathetic, but you can still lead, you know, provide guidance, learn how to, you know, give them rope, pull it in, give them rope, pull it in because, we also have to we also have to accept kids that they're going to make mistakes and the mistakes are theirs to make. Right. We can't we can't give them so much advice 
then we think they're going to listen and not make those mistakes. Come on, mm-hmm. like get over yourself. They're all going to make their mistakes. Their mis- those are their mistakes to make. We just have to be there and, and help them through it and try to give them perspective, right? So leadership, don't be afraid to lead. Oh, that's awesome. I, I love all of that. Those are great points. Um, Farhan, thanks so much for taking time. I know you're, uh, you're waiting for your, well, he's not so little anymore, but you're, uh, Luke to finish up, uh, his training session. So we'll let you get back at it, but I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me and all the coaches. I'm sure we'll get a lot out of this. So thank you. Hey, thanks so much for doing this because it's a great service and it's very, very much needed. All right. Take care. We'll talk to you again. All right. See you later. For more information on Tackle It and how you can become a Tackle It ambassador, you can visit our website at tackleit.org. If you would like to tell your story, please email us at tellyourstory at tackleit.org. We all need a champion, and we bring you these with those who are willing to tell their story.